O tēnā koutou kato, nā mahi nunui ki te mana whenua, o te rohi nei, ngā mana, ngā rangatira, ngā reo, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko te Māori e arataki ana i au Aotea Roa ki te ao kei mua, Māori leading New Zealand into the future. A bold new vision to guide ngā pai o te maramatanga, New Zealand's Māori Centre of Research Excellence, in our research and a vision that I wish to ground this address today. So it's an honour to commence this symposium that marks the decision our ancestors made more than 175 years ago to put their marks on Te Tariti. Our communities have long histories, deep knowledge and many solutions to contribute to guide these lands forward in a flourishing manner. All three branches of Aotearoa New Zealand's government must step up and encourage this contribution. As we all know, just mere years after Te Tariti was signed, Māori impatience with the imposed Western-derived state legal system resonated. The long 175 years have borne protests, petitions, wars and marches. The frustration at the injustice and crimes of lands taken, waters polluted and language denied are experiences of our past and present, but must not be our future. I want to consider this morning. I want to consider this morning nothing particularly new. The experts that are all in this room alone is overwhelming, with much already said and known. Particularly when I saw Justice Joe Williams walk in, um, <laughs> who should really be here opening rather than me. And a lot of my um, talk this morning is drawing on Justice Joe Williams' words. Yikes. Okay, so the focus this morning is to simply retell how the judicial precedents ascribed to the Treaty of Waitangi have created space or not for the broader rec recognition and implementation of the four first laws of this land, Māori law. This address sits within a broader research project that seeks to explore to what extent the judicial meanings ascribed to the Treaty of Waitangi have driven the development of the Māori dimension of Aotearoa New Zealand. So the challenge and opportunity within the state legal system to recognise and provide for Māori law has always been present since 1840. But perhaps for the first time in 175 years, the scaffolding for the dominant legal system to step up has been laid, as will be my conclusion this morning. So the story, our story, our non-fiction reality... We know that the frontier years of contact and encounter created the basis for a curious approach to considering the validity of the Treaty of Waitangi and Māori law. We know how the treaty has fared within our judiciary in the past and what was said, for instance, in the Simons case, the Weparata case, the Te Whuhu Tuakino case. As Justice Joe Williams considered in his Lex Aotearoa address, the debate about whether the Treaty of Waitangi should be the mechanism through which to bring together Māori law and state law. But as Justice Williams remarked, the judiciary early on avoided framing this as the legal debate because the judiciary rejected the treaty as an instrument having any legal effect. As Justice Williams wrote in that address, Prendergast and Weparata famously described the treaty as a simple nullity, at least as an instrument of session. Māori lacked sovereign capacity, they possessed none of the usual furniture of government and law, said the Chief Justice, and so could claim none of the advantages of the second law. And in Te Huhu, 64 years later, the Privy Council, while implicitly at least rejecting the nullity thesis, nonetheless considered that an international treaty had no direct enforceability at domestic law. The Treaty of Waitangi then, still reading from Justice Joe Williams' work, was New Zealand's terra nullius, roundly rejected as a source of rights within the second law. And it is, as Justice Williams' Lex Aotearoa address, that I want to stay with for a moment. In that address, he positions that... There are three lines of law in Aotearoa, New Zealand. There was and always will be Māori law, the first law. Then there was the second law, the colonial law, founded in England and applied here in 1840. It began to run alongside the first law, doing its best to eliminate it. Or, in Justice Williams' words, this is where tikanga Māori was recognised during the colonial period. It was recognised only to the extent necessary to succeed in extinguishing it. 
The, the Crown recognised native title in the period prior to the native land court only so that it could purchase it on the highly advantageous terms or take it as the spoils of war. The government recognised native title through the native land court only for the purpose of facilitating the destruction of customary tenure and the alienation of the new individualised land interests. The criminal law ordinances of the 1840 and the resident magistrate system of 1846 were seen as temporary ne temporarily necessary to smooth the path to assimilation. All were brief stopovers on a linear path to extinction. And then Justice Williams argues that from the 1970s on, the second law has been subsumed by a third law, the contemporary modern law. As Justice Williams stated, there is a key distinction between law in the colonial period and that of the post-1970s modern period. So according to Justice Williams, the recognition of custom in the modern era is different. It is intended to be permanent and admittedly within the broad confines of the status quo transformative. So Justice Williams is right in many ways. Of course he is. <laughs> <laughs> and in the 1970s onwards emerged a new approach within the state legal system towards the Treaty of Waitangi, especially so in the 1970s the creation of the Waitangi Tribunal, in the 1980s with the commencement of statutory inclusions of the phrase the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi as a directive to decision makers, and in the 1990s with the implementation of the contemporary Treaty of Waitangi Settlement Statutes. This new recognition of the treaty is, as Justice Williams explores, leading to a new recognition of Māori law within the state legal system. Examples exist across the legal system from environmental, criminal, family and intellectual property. But are our first laws, Māori laws, really being recognised? And who is doing this recognition? I agree the executive and the legislative branches of government have stepped up somewhat since the 1970s to recognise the treaty on a scale not present prior to then. With statutory recognition of the treaty has come statutory recognition of some of our first laws, Māori law. So for example, Te Tūri Whenua Māori Act, our Māori Land Act of 1993, recognises whāngai, Māori customary adoptions. The Resource Management Act recognises the practices of kaitiakitanga and the importance of wahi, wahi tapu in taonga in lands and waters. The Property Relationships Act recognises that taonga ought not to be considered family chattels in relationship property divisions. The Treaty Settlement Statutes give further life to some of our Māori laws in innovative ways. The Ngāitahu Claim Settlement Act of 1998 includes the stories of, for example, the creation of Ōraki Mount Cook. The Ngāwai o Maniapoto Waipa River Act of 2012 embraces poetic language to convey how special that river is to Maniapoto. For example, the river chants its farewells to our departed ones, its murmuring waters bid welcome to our newborn and to our illustrious visitors from afar. And the Uruwera Act 2014, which stipulates that it is tuhoitanga that must be recognised and reflected in caring for the Uruwera, a place that the law now recognises as having its own legal personality. And the creation of rangatahi courts and the appointment of Māori land court judges to sit as environment court judges are other examples of innovative initiatives that help to maintain our Māori laws within the state legal system. The question must now be, has the third branch of government, the courts, likewise stepped up? To some extent, yes. We have the renamed Lands case, now known as the SOE case, where the then President Cook declared partnership as a key principle of the treaty, and later extrajudicially remarked that the treaty is simply the most important document in New Zealand history. Subsequent cases and policy documents have since referenced the treaty as our founding constitutional document. Chief Sean Elias even presented a remarkable speech at the annual the Hongaroya Māori Māori Law Society conference last year in Waitangi, where she clearly referred to and articulated the Treaty of Waitangi as law. I accept that there has been some judicial progress, and while we are co-editing a mammoth book on just this topic, Te Akinga, with a small team of authors, um, with Joe and Kawam, um, so there is content to work with. But really, what inroads have the courts really substantively made to recognise Māori law? 
Justice Williams himself refers to the integration as fragile and rightly identifies an overall systematic failure to do so that exists because of attitudinal and majoritarian reluctance and that judges themselves are mostly untrained and therefore poorly equipped to address first laws. Justice Williams knows the judiciary needs to up its game. And I couldn't agree more, our jurisprudence is failing. Sometimes I think of our laws as railway tracks. Others do this too, or streams or other like analogies. The first railway tracks are Māori laws. The second railway tracks begin much further along and run parallel. The first 100 years of the second railway tracks have been built with many kinks as they determinedly smash against the first railway tracks. I don't necessarily think that a third railway track was built in the 1970s. Rather, I see the second railway tracks merely changing colour from a blood red to a rust red with more bridges across to the first railway tracks than was evident previously. These tracks remain the colour of blood today because the law is still killing our peoples, our lands and waters. Not on the same scale as the late 1800s, but it is our people who mostly sit in our country's jails and we still struggle to recreate our healthy economies on healthy, sustaining lands and waters. The Resource Management Act is a perfect example. The RMA provides the rules for managing land, air and water. It requires decision makers to have a level of regard to Māori laws and the Treaty of Waitangi. The principles contained in Section 6E, Wahitapu and Taonga, Section 7A, Kaitiakitanga, Section 8, the Treaty of Waitangi, provide a platform for recognising Māori interests in and responsibilities to, for example, water. But how effective are these legislative recognitions? So let's consider four RMA cases. The first one, here a regional council granted resource consents to Genesis Power to enable the Tongarero Hydroelectric Power Development Scheme to continue operating. Ngāti Rangi opposed the consents primarily because it involved mixing of water, the diversion of several rivers into Lake Taupo and then into the Waikato River and that the power plant had already hindered their cultural traditions because of the reduced flow of water, reduced water levels, degraded water quality, and a change to the ecological system that affects the food chain in the water. While the Environment Court accepted in part Ngāti Rangi's arguments and restricted the consents from 35 years to 10 years, the appeal courts overruled that decision and reinstated consents at the maximum permitted under the RMA, 35 years. So on balancing the need for electricity against the need to protect Māori relationships with water, electricity trumps in that area unhindered for the next 35 years. In a second set of cases, Carter Holt Harvey was issued a 21-year term resource consent for discharge to water permits for its pulp and paper plant. Ngāti Tūwhari Tōa opposed. The Environment Court had some sympathy for the iwi and held that Carter Holt Harvey must give the iwi a more participatory role by reporting to the iwi any legal issue or any issues arising from the operation. However, the High Court disagreed and held that Tūwhari Tōa have no consultation interests in the resource consents, cultural values resoundingly lost. And a third example, a Māori group, Tōtari, appealed a resource consent issued to several farmers to construct a farm irrigation dam on a stream and then take up to 2,700 cubic metres of water per day. Tōtari, who just lived six kilometres downstream of the proposed dam, argued that there had been inadequate consultation and that the migration of traditional fish species would be disrupted. The court disagreed. The irrigation dam was permitted to be built without any consideration to Māori cultural values. And as a last example of lost cases for Māori, in 2010, the Environment Court considered the arguments of Mani Apoto, who opposed the resource consent awarded to the Waitomo District Council to establish and operate a wastewater treatment plant that would discharge 135.5 cubic metres per day of treated sewage from the plant into the river. To Mani Apoto, it was fundamentally abhorrent that the idea of treated human waste being discharged into a waterway from which food has traditionally been taken. Instead, they supported a land-based disposal system. The Environment Court held that discharge to river is the only practical solution at this stage. Mani Apoto lost. So that's four examples. 
Unfortunately, they're not the odd one that ones out. In fact, when one looks at all of the court decisions taken by Māori opposing a resource consent to do something with water, it becomes clear that Māori are way more likely to lose than win. In fact, I can confidently say that Māori consistently, nearly, always lose in the courts in RMA cases regarding water. And I've developed a pie chart that demonstrates visually the Māori experience in the courts with the RMA in regard to water cases. By far the majority of the pie chart is coloured with lost cases. But there are some partial wins or partial losses, it depends on how optimistic or not I feel on the day as to how I label those category of cases. So these partial wins or partial losses are those cases where Māori have lost that the resource consent has still been issued to do something to the water that Māori do not want, but that a condition has been imposed on the consent that goes some way to address the concerns of Māori. So, for example, let's take the case of the Bay of Plenty Regional Council reissued to the Rotorua District Council a resource consent to take up to 3,500 cubic metres of water, water per day from the Taniwha Springs. Ngāti Rangawewehi appealed the decision. The Environment Court partially agreed to the iwi's concerns and reduced the term of the resource consent from 25 years to 10 years but left untouched the permitted maximum daily volume and rate of water take. But yes, there are a small number of, uh, um, of wins for Māori, a very small handful. While the RMA was enacted in 1991, the first of these clear wins did not occur until 2002. This case concerned an argument posed by the Federated Farmers in North Canterbury that a man-made drain channel was not subject to minimum flow requirements. The Environment Court accepted Naitahu's argument that it was subject to the requirements because the drain was linked to the Cust River and had capacity to support traditional use and values. The second one was one that involved a North Island situation where the iwi opposed a decision to grant consent to the Papakura District Council to construct and operate tidal gates on a tidal estuary inlet for the purposes of creating recreational opportunities. The iwi opposed this because it would interfere with the natural flow of the tide and thus the wairua of the water would decay. The Environment Court agreed. There is a third sort of muddled, muddled win. Port Tauranga sought resource consents to widen and deepen its entry channel to accommodate larger ships, but in applying to do so, refused to have some regard, refused to have regard to the Tauranga iwi interests. The Environment Court accepted that the proposal would create significant adverse effects, but still approved the resource consents, albeit with conditions. It is the conditions that make this a kind of win for the Tauranga iwi. Condition one, notice to commence this work must not be given for at least five years. Condition two, at the time of notification, Port Tauranga and Tauranga iwi must enter into a process of consultation and consider alternatives. The process must engage at least one year of discussions and then up to another year for further peer reviews. Condition three, if work is to commence, then the port must pay to the trustees of the Mataitai Reserve the sum of 50000 per annum for five years. So thus overall, while the RMA does provide a platform for Māori to air their concerns, these concerns constitute just one of several factors that the decision makers and the courts must consider. The fact that Māori often lose in the courts is not for lack of judicial awareness of the importance of the RMA protections to Māori. For example, our then top appeal court, the Privy Council, stated back in 2002 that Section 6E, 7A and 8 provide strong directions to be borne in mind at every stage of the planning process and that if alternative proposals exist that do not significantly affect Māori, then preference should be given to those alternatives, even if they are not ideal. However, in that case, which concerned the laying of roads and not the take of water, Māori still lost. And then there are strange things that happen to Māori laws. A good example of this is the Property Relationships Act. The Treaty of Waitangi is absent from the statute, but laying in, lying in the interpretation part of this Act is Section 2, is the definition of the family chattel that excludes taonga and heirlooms from relationship property division pool. The relevant cases to invoke the taonga exception to family chattels are those argued in the family and the appeal courts and cases where a Pākehā partner has sought to keep separate from his or her separated partner a painting. 
The lawyers, not able to position artwork as an heirloom, have argued artwork that has no relationship to Māori in any way, that is, the art is not by Māori artist or of a Māori subject or owned by a Māori couple, is taonga. And the High Court judge that first accepted this argument and thus opened this gate was our most esteemed, now retired, Justice Eddie Jury. The gate was closed in 2012 by a Pākehā family court judge. Anyway, that's a curious incident. I come back to my generalised statement, though, that the legislature is creating false hopes and the courts are creating a failing jurisprudence in regard to the Treaty of Waitangi and Māori law. The RMA and water cases are but just one example. But if the law is doing this to water, our lifeblood, we have to take note. There is, of course, a glaring exception amongst our judiciary. There is a much more progressive court that is embracing Māori law on a daily basis, the Māori Land Court. There is today a depth, confidence and maturity in this court when dealing with tikanga Māori. This is, as it should be, the legislative branch demands this. For example, the Treaty of Waitangi grounds the preamble of Te Tūdi Whenua Māori Act in its opening sentence, so reading in English, but of course this appears first in Māori and the Act itself makes it clear that the Māori version of this preamble trumps. The Treaty of Waitangi established the special relationship between Māori people and the Crown, and whereas it is desirable that the spirit of the exchange of kawanatanga for the protection of rangatiratanga, rangatiratanga embodied in the Treaty of Waitangi is reaffirmed. Also in the Act, it requires that judges on this point court are appointed against criteria of suitability that includes the person's knowledge and experience of te reo Māori, tikanga Māori and the Treaty of Waitangi. Also in the Act, um, any party or witness in any proceedings before the court may give evidence or address the court in Māori. The judge may apply to the hearing such rules of marae kawa as the judge considers appropriate and the High Court can state a case for the Māori Appellate Court on any question of tikanga Māori. In the Māori Land Court there is an abundance of interesting cross-cultural decisions. There is a richness in the Māori Land Court and in the Waitangi Tribunal that we should certainly not ignore and in fact should study closely for inspiration on how our whole judiciary could one day soon become. Now Michael might very well disagree with me as he'll probably know the on the ground details of this case but from looking afar the Quinn and Coote case I think is a good case that demonstrates the new directions of the Māori Land Court. This case extends existing jurisprudence to emphasise whakapapa genealogy, but this time within the context of adopted in children in the Titi Islands. So this case holds that the Adoption Act fiction captured in section 16 2A that a child becomes deemed the blood child of the adoptive parents does not apply in regard to succession to the Titi Islands. This is because other law specific to the Titi Islands gives prominence to whakapapa and legal adoptions ought not to muddy this. Or in other words, a child may be a child in law but not in fact. This case and others not discussed here read together reinforce a growing precedent set by the Māori Land Court that the importance of blood relationships with Māori land, land is fundamental to a point where, if pushed, whakapapa will be prioritised prioritised over whānau, and ways around legal fiction, such as in section 16.2a, will be found. This decision certainly limits the rights of adopted children into the whānau with Titi Island interests. While their adoptive parent with the blood link to the Titi Islands is alive, they will be able to enter the Titi Islands and take birds. But once that adoptive parent dies, will these children and their children be able to continue to enjoy access to these islands? perhaps only with permission from the Rakiura Titi Committee, and perhaps this is as it should be in accordance with Māori law. So I imagine if our legislative branch demanded like judicial criteria across our judicial branch, the flow-on effects for such an expectation would be felt back in our schools and universities, the requirements for understanding of te reo, tikanga, marae kawa. This ought to be in the near future, Interestingly, the Otago District Courts, or is it the District Courts across the country, I'm not sure, released just weeks ago an excellent one-page document about how te reo Māori will now be used in the District Courts. It is but one small but significant step. And so to conclude, we're now 40 years along William's third era of law, or my different coloured second railway tracks. 
I'm impatient for the next era, and I'm optimistic that we might just be entering it, or at least laying down some good scaffolding for the dominant legal system to step up. 2015 looks very different to 1970. We now have hundreds of Māori lawyers, more than a dozen Māori judges, and more than 20 years now of Māori academics in most of the law schools, and decent numbers of Māori students in the universities gaining LLBs and even postgraduate degrees, including from the flash universities in the world like Harvard, NYU, Toronto and Cambridge. We have some strong allied researchers, lawyers and judges. Our Māori communities are regaining in strength and have a vision for pathways forward. Evidence of this is abundant, for example, in treaty settlements and iwi management plans throughout the country. I'm hopeful for change. It is as it must be. Ko te Māori e arataki ana i a Aotearoa ki te ao kei mua, Māori leading New Zealand into the future. Kia ora koutou mō tēnei hui, um, tēnā koutou katoa.